here's another lesson. Organization is not paid staff. Organization is a volunteers uh, in, a, in a local community. So important for folks to sort of internalize that. Empower volunteers to take on increased responsibility. We call that the ladder of engagement. You kind of get them in the door by signing up on an email list. Uh, then we reach out and say, hey, you want to come in the office and learn a little bit more about what we're doing in your community? Okay, we'll stop in. And, you know, we'll say, well, why don't you come out and knock on doors with us? See if you like it. And you just keep walking them up this ladder of engagement. Before they know it, they're a team leader uh, because they've accepted this role and, and got bought in. But they, if you would have asked them right off the bat, are you willing to give us 35 hours a week? You know, they would say no. Um, help volunteers feel part of something larger. Again, this transparent goal setting is very, very important. If they know why they're doing the work they're doing, they're much more likely to do it. And not just check the box and do it, but be very you know, motivated and feel uh, invested in it. Invest volunteers to be accountable for program results. So you went here, fired a volunteer. It's an awkward, awkward experience. <laughs> they're not getting paid. Um, but people, when they become a team leader or a community organizer, the top of our volunteer structure, make a commitment. And if they don't hold themselves accountable to that commitment, we do. And we bring someone else in. Again, it has to be merit-based. If it's not merit-based, what does it mean to be a team leader? And then finally, helps build personal relationships, uh, which is not only the right thing to do, but again, once that personal relationship is built, specifically within the team, they feel committed to themselves, right? Like oftentimes, volunteers will come into a campaign because of the candidate, but they'll stay because of the relationship and the experience they have with both the staff and other volunteers in that office. Here's an example, this is Virginia. So I was a state director in Virginia in 2008. Um, it, it could have been, it could be me or, you know, we had the field director here. So there's 3.7 million voters in Virginia. Obviously that's too much for Johannes Abraham who was our field director to manage. So underneath that then we had 10 regionals, right? That one to 10 ratio. So that means each regional was responsible for roughly 370 voters. Again, that's way too much, right? So then we had about 100 field organizers. So now each organizer is responsible for about 37,000 votes. Then we had about 10 team leaders uh, uh, you know, underneath that. And then underneath those team leaders, we'd have team members. Underneath those team members, we'd have volunteers. So by the end of it, a volunteer would be roughly responsible for 40 votes, which is totally manageable, right? And that's how we would try to look at how can we break up a state or a congressional district or a precinct so that you make these numbers manageable. <clears throat> this is very, very important. Oftentimes when people talk about a grassroots organization or a volunteer organization, they think that's free. It's not. Not only does it take an incredible investment in time and energy and training, it frankly takes a lot of financial investment as well. So this is sort of the, the ratio that we would look at over time. Field organizers are paid staff. As we got staffed and ramped up with field organizers, they were able to identify, train, and invest team leaders. As team leaders got on board, they were able to identify trust, or excuse me, uh, in trust uh, neighborhood team members. Those team members then were able to get volunteers. But you can't have one without the other. That ratio of you know, one to five to 10 holds true throughout all of this. Uh, and so you can't have five staff and 5,000 team leaders. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, so your staff footprint is directly relatable to your grassroots footprint. And you can't have one without the other. You just can't. How to build a volunteer organization. Uh, you identify potential volunteer leaders. You can do this by holding public events, having folks self-select. You can organize neighborhood parties. Uh, we've held literally thousands, tens of thousands uh, of local strategy uh, organizing kickoff strategy session meetings uh, throughout Organizing for America, uh, all over the country, all over the country. Uh, reach out to existing community leaders. You know, just trying to find as many leads, so we call them, we call them a hot leads list, many leads as possible. How do you then convert a prospect into a volunteer leader? First, you have to persuade prospects to believe in the campaign by one, you're gonna tell your personal story. Who wouldn't love to hear me tell that Barack Obama story again, right? Number two, helping them meet a like-minded community uh, member. Let them know that they're not in this by themselves. Volunteering is a social aspect, right? It's a social activity. 
When we went back and asked our volunteers, what did you enjoy most? It was the staff that they met, the other volunteers that they met. It was, a, it was the social aspect of going into the office, being a part of something much bigger than them personally. So, so important. Train them to complete an activity, and then you celebrate that. Lift up their success. Uh, let them know how important it is, uh, but also uh, uh, let them know that everyone appreciates the work they did to you know, successfully complete that activity. Give them a title and resources. Once they make that commitment, say you are our team leader. Congratulations. They literally sign a contract. Uh, and then we need to give them the resources, access to our voter file. You know, I just talked about how important data integrity is. The fact that we're opening that up to a non-paid staffer just kind of shows how important um, you know, we feel these volunteers are. They have basically access to the lifeline of our organization. Uh, give them a clear goal and plan to reach it. You know, we talked about data uh, and using data to achieve goals, to set goals, and then explain that to folks so they get bought in. And then help them identify and convert other potential volunteer leaders. Um, you guys ever seen that picture? You know, you have the big fish chasing the little fish, and then the next one, you have all those little fish in the shape of a big fish chasing the sort of, I guess now, medium-sized fish? Well, it's tough to describe. Anyway. That's what that is. This is what uh, the organization looks like uh, on paper. So you have your community organizer, you have your neighborhood team leaders connected to your community organizer, and then each neighborhood team leader has neighborhood team members. And you could go even more granular than this because you could then have your neighborhood team members and you could have you know, lines of folks coming off here as well. We call this the snowflake model. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's replicatable. I don't know if that's a word, but uh, it's something that you can do uh, everywhere. And it can be a self-sustaining, sort of strong, foundational uh, grassroots organization. So here's the, the team model again. Uh, this is a bit redundant on the slide that you guys saw earlier. And then finally, that's great, right? I just, we just kind of walked through neighborhood team leaders and why that makes sense. But act, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, it has to show results. There has to be a reason why we're doing this sort of organizing as opposed to any other side, right? Uh, during the Obama campaign, volunteers in teams worked more than twice as many hours as volunteers who did not work in teams. Uh, it creates manageable volunteer ratios, spreads volunteer strengths across precincts, empowers volunteers to take on more responsibility, helps you identify uh, uh, good volunteers, and also helps volunteers feel part of something bigger than themselves. And then this last slide shows. So this is again in Virginia in October. Um, the number of voter contact calls we could have done with just staff, uh, but by making this many volunteer calls uh, to build teams, this is how many phone calls our teams were able to make in Virginia that last month. Um, so I'll just, I'll, let me close by saying this. A um, couple things. I didn't go specifically into online as its own separate entity because it's not. It's not. You need to take a comprehensive, holistic approach and view of a voter. Uh, and some folks prefer to have their relationships stay online, and some folks don't. You know, the president has a gigantic Twitter account. Gigantic. Huge Facebook account. Uh, but a, a contact on Facebook uh, it, well, maybe not quite as influential as a, as a, as a knock at the door or a direct mail piece or, or some, you know, uh, a TV commercial. It is a communication. And if they came to us through Facebook and they want our relationship to stay on Facebook, then we as a campaign have to respect that. So, you know, the challenge that we have now moving forward is this neighborhood team leader model. Uh, we want to make that available to folks online. So that if they feel more comfortable with their relationship with our organization living online, then we need to respect that. Shouldn't try to force people to, to come to us. It's our responsibility as an organization or a movement to come to them. Uh, and then the last thing that I'll say, because I know I've, I've rambled here and I apologize, um, but we haven't talked Aussie football. We'll do that at lunch, I guess. Um, is this, is that organization building is tough. I think people think there's a silver bullet and there's not. It takes incredible work, takes incredible investment uh, in, in resources, in time, in dedication. It can be frustrating, but ultimately at the end of it, if you do it right, you have people who are not only invested and committed 
and the president. More importantly, no, more importantly, they're invested and committed to the people around them and their team. You know, I've been doing this now for four and a half years, longer than any relationship I've ever had. I mean, like, way longer than any relationship I've ever had. <laughs> and I've gotten a lot out of it, right? I have a, I have a great title. It's sweet. I send out emails all the time. People, they usually send negative things back to me. But, you know, I, I've certainly achieved more professionally than I ever would have imagined. Um, uh, but I've sacrificed a lot for this. Uh, but I know at the end of it, I can look myself in the mirror, and no one else can take this away from me, that I was part of, partly responsible for, uh, a once you know, in, in two century uh, effort. And while that's great, you know, I'm a paid staffer, I should, you know, that's my job. I'm not alone, there's 1.2 million other folks who weren't paid, who look themselves in the mirror and have that same sort of realization. And that's an organization. You know, organization is not staff driven, uh, it's volunteer driven. And um, you know, we were able to accomplish that in 2008. It's a lot of work to keep it going. And as we move forward in 2012, we're gonna grow and build and make it bigger. So with that, um, look forward to the panel discussion and answering any questions. Thanks.